Thank you for talking to me. It's great to have you here. It's Christmas. It looks great. Um, let me have your names first. What's your name? Megan. Ella. I'm James. Okay, Megan, Ella and James. Yes. All right. Let's hope I don't get this in the wrong order somehow. <laughs> first question, what do you think Christmas is all about? Uh, personally, I think it's all about family coming together. It's appreciating what you have and being able to come back as a unit and celebrate being together and being able to enjoy a time where people are less fortunate and be appreciating that. So it's all about family for you? Yeah. For me, yeah. No, same. Mine's all about family, seeing each other, seeing family members you haven't seen for a very long time and just celebrating. Yeah, yeah I'd say family, about giving, self receiving, giving, appreciate who you have around you and don't take anything for granted, really. Great. I mean, it's a nice spirit to have during Christmas. Yeah. Do you think Christmas has nothing to do with Jesus? I'll go Historically? Yeah. yeah, historically it historically. does. I feel like this day and age it's kind of come away from the religion and it's more about the presence now, I'd say. I think, I think it's definitely commercialised a lot more. However, I think the background is still there. I mean, we all appreciate that you go to church, you kind of do the service. It's um, about Jesus being born. You, uh, for Personally, I work in a school, so we always do nativity and we talk about Jesus and Christianity and the beliefs and the uh, uh, morals of Christmas, so it's a bit of everything. Earlier you told me you have Christian friends. Yeah. Do they ever come to you and say something like this, God has got a wonderful plan for your life? Okay. No, uh, I mean, I've never heard of it. None. Well, let's just pretend somebody comes along and tells you that. Yeah. What do you think they mean? Or what would it mean to you if somebody said, God has got a wonderful plan for your life? I think it, for me, it would mean that things happen for a reason. Yeah, like fate. Yeah. Almost, yeah. Sounds like fate. Yeah. yeah, like when you feel like you don't know which road to take, every road you take has sort of been guided and there's a reason some things don't work out because it's opening a door to something else and maybe that's because there's a bigger plan out there for us. Like comforting, yeah. in a way. It's sort of like a, a safety net, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, when it's yeah, I agree. When you have hard problems, when things don't work out, there's always a reason why it hasn't worked out. You can always overcome it, and yeah, just you have to believe there's always a better option. There's always a better way. So to you, when somebody says God has got a wonderful plan for your life, means that God somehow is in charge, and He will somehow work things out for your, for in your interest, for your for your the best outcome for yourself, right? As long as yeah. you are like a good person, I think he won't guide you in huge ways. It won't be major things. It'll be the small things that I've had. As I said, I've had conversations with religious friends and they believe it's like the little things that guide you and the little things that happen that actually push you in a different direction that you wouldn't initially think would happen. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you said as long as you're a good person. Yeah. 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 I mean, okay. everyone makes mistakes. Right. Everyone the, makes mistakes. The awful mistakes, you know, can't be. So, I mean, you, sometimes you make a mistake by accident yeah, or... Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're going to do a test called the good person test. Oh, <laughs> do it. <laughs> Are you ready? Ready. Yeah. yeah. Okay, how well do you think you'll do? Oh, I... I the sec. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's called the good person test, okay. and we base this on the Ten Commandments. I'm sure you'll agree that the moral standard of the Ten Commandments is pretty good standard to go by. So um, we're going to see how well you do against that. But do you know what the Ten Commandments are? Can you name any of them? I can't, no. Treat others how you wish to be treated, maybe? I know it's something where they were by a tem outside a temple on the walls and the walls would stay standing, I think, as long as you followed the Ten Commandments, possibly. I shall roughly. not kill. Is that <laughs> one? You shall not kill. Yeah. Is that the one? Is that I one? Don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't know any. Um, I'm not too sure. Okay. Well, thank I'm you for a, trying. I'm a bad person. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> You're going down. You just oh, don't God. know. Oh. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you for trying. Um, we're going we're gonna to do just four out of the Ten Commandments. Okay, okay. And before I start, let me make it very clear. I failed the Ten Commandment test, okay? The, the good person test. So we're going to see how well you do. Okay. You, I'm sure you're much better than me, all right? <laughs> so we're going to start with commandment number nine. How many lies have you told in your whole life? A lot. I mean, yeah, a lot. A fair few? Yeah, a fair few. Not big lies, but little ones. Like when I was younger, little kids trying <laughs> the to white get. Lies. Yeah, the one trying to get out of trouble, say, my dad says, oh, are you taking that chocolate? No, I haven't. <laughs> that kind of lies. Yeah. Well, let me make it clear. I mean, deceitful, selfish lies. Have you ever done a selfish lie? Something to get yourself out of trouble. You, you, 
You know you're lying and you do it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're guilty of that one. Yeah. All right. What do you call a person who tells a lie? A liar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. A liar. All right. We do number two. Okay. The commandment number eight. Have you ever taken something that doesn't belong to you? And then it doesn't matter how long ago. I mean, you could have done it some time ago. Uh, you may have even forgotten about it, but something that's not yours, you take it and the value doesn't matter either. Are you guilty of that? Yes, I, I think so. I think everyone's guilty of that. Maybe so it's kind of like taking a pen kind of thing. Yeah. It's little things, but you don't realize you're doing it when you're doing it. You know, sometimes we do bigger things and we don't know it. Like we download music that's not ours and we don't pay for it and Film that's stealing. Stuff. Yeah. Like films, yeah. so watch pirated DVD, yeah. DVD, you're done because you buy, yeah, you got it? Yep, yeah, done right. that. Yeah. We're there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're all done these things, right? Okay, what do you call a person who takes something that doesn't belong to them? Thief. Thief, yeah. Thief, yeah. So, I don't want to be... We're liars, we thieves. <laughs> <laughs> what else? <laughs> Basically bad people. <laughs> We're going to do two more. We'll get you out of your misery quickly, okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Have you ever used God's name in vain? You said, oh my G-O-D, J-C, that sort of thing. When you're angry, surprised, you know, you want to express disgust and use the God's name instead of using it for letter filth word. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And that's not too much. I don't really do it. I've got um, family in rel who's religious. Uh, my grandparents are, so I don't really um, say it that much. If I'm annoyed, I just walk off and have a tension chance them normally. <laughs> so, James, uh, I appreciate that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but when you say not too much means, the answer is yes. When you say not too much means yeah. you've done it. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah so, fair enough. All right. Now, it's a, it's a serious word that uh, go, is associated with taking God's name in vain. Starts with the letter B. Can you think of what it could be? Is blasphemy is that yeah oh, blasphemy. right yeah 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 and blasphemy is a big ugly thing because God says you're taking my name instead of a swear word and reducing his name down to demeaning it, demeaning demeaning it. it yeah Realizing. carelessly using using God's name so uh, it's big serious in God's eye in fact in, in fact he says that he won't hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain that's how serious he takes that okay let me tell you one last one and get you completely out of your misery all right okay <laughs> Now, this one you have to be extra honest, and I don't want to embarrass you, okay? But the Bible says we shouldn't commit adultery. That means we shouldn't cheat on our spouses. But Jesus said, even if you look at another person with lustful thoughts, you know, you look at somebody and you fancy them and you have lustful thoughts, you're guilty of committing adultery in your heart. Would you say you've ever looked at somebody? I mean, it could be a movie star. It could be anything. You look at somebody, you fancy them. I think everyone's done that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely guilty yes. of that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to stop now, right? <laughs> we're done. <laughs> okay, so by your own admission, and I'm not judging you. Like I said, nobody here is better than you. You're, uh, you've confessed to me that you've lied, stolen, blasphemed, and committed adultery in your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you appear before God, and remember, God could see all things, right? Everything you've done in secret, man, to him is like an open book. He sees it all. And he judge you by that standard. We've done four only, and there's another six pointing at you and me, right? Yeah. Um, would you come out innocent or guilty? Guilty. 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 Okay. If God cares about right and wrong and he's perfect in justice and righteousness and holiness, what would he do with a guilty person? Could you possibly repent if you were to sort of commit to God and say, I've sinned and I'm sorry and it's genuine, he would be forgiving because from what I've understood, God is forgiving. We are his, his children. You know what's interesting about that? that that's nowhere in the Bible, which is very interesting. But if you think along the lines of a judge, if a criminal robbed a bank or stole a car or did any other heinous crime and appeared before a judge and he asked for forgiveness, the judge is obliged by the letter of the law to enact justice and that person will go to prison, right? We think of a judge more highly than we do about God. So we say, to, we expect God to forgive us, but a judge wouldn't. So if God is no worse than a judge, what would he do with a guilty person? Would he kill them? End their fate line short? Maybe? Well, it's, it's not far off. If there was heaven and hell, where would we? Oh, hell. hell is for hell. to repent your sins and then find redemption once you've sort of paid for your crimes. According to the Bible, hell is a place where somebody goes to pay for a fine. 
but you never pay it off. Let's say, for example, you are guilty of robbing a car, you have an accident, you, you run up a big cost in this accident, and there's a bail on you of 100,000 pounds. The judge will send you to prison until you pay the fine. And that's why sin, well, that's why committing uh, a sin against God is eternal, because you never pay that fine. How would you pay it, right? Make sense? It's, it's difficult because um, I'd say that you know, the religion's been going on for thousands of years, yeah. back then it, it, it was a massive thing. These days, it's religion's not the most biggest, the biggest thing now, and it's difficult because everyone, you could ask anyone, everyone, everyone's done one, done one of the sins. It's just these days, the modern days, and trying to uh, cope and recognize from religion is quite difficult to put them two together. Well, thank you for that, James. Thank you for sharing that. I think there's some truth in what you said, but what I'm saying is very relevant for Christmas. That's why I had to push you that far to get you to understand the purpose of why Jesus had to come. When I asked you earlier, what did Jesus come to do? You had your own personal opinion about it, but now you're about to discover what he really came to do. Now, if God was perfectly just and he punished people who broke his law and he sent them to hell and that turned out to be you, would it concern you? It would, naturally, but I could understand yeah. the reason for it. You will accept that, but it w you wouldn't want it. Uh, it, it. No one wants to. I mean, it's very good of you to acknowledge that it's a deserving punishment, but it will concern me, and, and I'm sure it will concern you, right? Yeah. 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 Because we don't want to go there. No. No. If there's a way out, we want to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. I've got some good news for you, because. This is what Christmas is all about. You see, you and I are guilty of breaking God's laws and standard. And if God was just and he cared about right and wrong, well, we're going down because God cannot turn a blind eye to criminals. So how does he punish them? Well, he sends them to his prison. He calls that hell. It's a place of punishment. It's a place of pain and suffering. But God loves us so much at the same time. It's kind of like the judge is your father and he doesn't want to punish you, but he has to. But what does he do? What would a judge do if he was your father? He has to both punish you and he doesn't want to at the same time. So what does he do? Knowing that there is no way out, he came down himself 2,000 years ago, entered into humanity through Jesus to live amongst people so that he can lay down his life for people and die a horrible death on the cross and rose again on the third day to show us that he's got power over death, sin and hell forever. So that now when you appear before God on Judgment Day, there is a transaction that took place. It's a legal transaction. You committed the crime, he paid for the fine. So when you appear before God on Judgment Day and he announces you as guilty, Jesus has paid for your fine. He can still dismiss your case because your fine has been paid for by somebody else. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. But what happens, I don't want to be too picky, but what happens if someone's like a murderer or something? Does he forgive a murderer or rapist or something like that? You know what, James, you ask a very good question. You see, to you, a murderer is somebody who goes and kills somebody. But in God's standard, Jesus said that if you as much as hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. If you as much as look at the person with lustful thoughts, you've committed adultery in your heart. Can you see the standard here? Yeah. You see, God will punish the murderer, don't get me wrong. And he will punish the rapist. But he won't stop there. He'll punish the liar, the thief, the blasphemer, because his standards are much higher. He will even judge us by thoughts and, and, not, and not just words or our, our actions. He will even look down into our thoughts because perfection demands that everything is examined. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if God is just, he can turn a blind eye. But as just as he is, he's also very loving. And he reconciles those two things on the cross. So he dies on the cross, showing you both justice and mercy at the same time. Isn't that an incredible story? Now, let me tell you something. There is something you have to do. So if you remember nothing else, you need to remember this. To receive this gift, you have to do something which is similar to what you said. That's why I said it's not in the Bible. You said, can't you say sorry? Well, you do. You have to say sorry, but in this case is remorse, repentance. You turn away from those things, so you don't do them anymore. But that's not enough. That's why I said that's not what the Bible says. Somebody's got to pay for the fine. It can't just let you go. So you've got to do this other thing, which is put your trust in the work that Jesus did on the cross. So it's not believing in God that would reconcile you. You couldn't just say, I believe in God, any more than a criminal can say, I believe in a judge, because the judge is going to be the one that's going to bring him down. 
But you have to put your trust in the person who bails you out. In this case, in a judge environment, a guy walks in and pays for your fine. That's the person you put your trust in. So that's what you've got to do. You've got to say sorry, turn away. That's repentance. One word, repentance. But that's not what saves you. What saves you is putting your trust in the work that Jesus did. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. When do you think is a good time for someone to repent and put their faith in Jesus? When do you think one should do this? Yeah, Christmas. Christmas. Uh, and yeah. what are we now? Christmas. <laughs> I don't think there's any time you can repent. There are churches all around the world. It's to, be, to be honest, you don't need a church to repent, right? <laughs> if I said to you, I'm going to give you a million pounds, when would it be the right time for you to take it? Any time, wouldn't it? If I do it now, when would you take it? Now. And if I give you eternal life and I showed you a way that you can spend eternally in heaven, when would it be the right time to take it? No. No. Yeah. Okay, so you're not making any more mistakes. Well, you're going to continue making mistakes and that's not what's going to save you. What's going to save you is that Jesus paid for it. He's, he pays for the fine on our behalf. But, and you try your best. I mean, but you don't do it to be saved. You don't do it so that you become a Christian. You do it because you want to please your Father in heaven who paid for your fine who went at length he said i'll come into humanity to save us you're now so grateful you do it out of gratitude not out of fear make sense yeah well you guys have been amazing can i ask you to think about it and and be right with god today absolutely so thank you so much for your time that's what the christmas message message is all about and i'm so grateful you understood it and i want you to respond to it in a way that makes sense and in a way that will give you eternal life is that okay yes thank yeah you. definitely and i've got a gift for each and every one of you <laughs> <laughs> now you may or may not have a bible but part of the pack i'm going to give you has a bible in it can i encourage you to read it yes yeah. read it every day obey what it says and go to a good church. Are you? Are you? You said in Lincoln. Do you live in Lincoln? No, no. I go to university here. Oh, I live down south. Yeah, we're from Kent. Go, go to a good yeah. church. You know, you know, Bible believing, God fearing church. And and but more importantly, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than if you go to a garage, it doesn't make you a car, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to get you a book, a Bible. I want you to read, and I've got some other gifts in it, and therefore you like a chocolate.